Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Economic Journal Lecture section of this conference. My name is Ekaterina Zhuravska. I'm a professor uh, of economics at the Paris School of Economics, and I'm a managing co-editor of the Economic Journal. And as a chair of this session, I have several very nice jobs today to do. So the first one is the following. On behalf of the editorial board of the Economic <coughs> Journal, I'm delighted to announce the winners of the Austin Robinson Memorial Prize. And that actually will be for two years, for 2019 and 2020. This award honors the best paper published in the Economic Journal in a given year by authors within five years of graduation or from their doctoral program. And the winner for 2019 year is a very nice paper entitled is legal pot crippling Mexican drug trafficking organizations the effect of medical marijuana laws on US crime? And the authors of this paper are Evelina Gavrilova, Takuma Kamada, and Floris Zutman. The paper shows that decriminalization of the production and distribution of marijuana leads to a substantial reduction in violent crime in markets that are traditionally controlled by Mexican drug dealers, Mexican traffickers, in fact. And uh, it's a very, very nice paper. The other nice paper, which got the prize in 2020, is called Agricultural Returns to Labor and uh, uh, the Origin of Work Ethics. It's written by Vasiliki Fuka and Alan Schlepfer. And this paper develops a theory of uh, the emergence of work ethic depending on the conditions of agricultural labor in historical perspective and tests uh, this theory relying on the variation within Europe. So I would like to say congratulations uh, to both authors of both papers. This is a remarkable achievement. And uh, to everybody, I would like to say that there is a selection of videos featuring the winners of the prize, which is available on the economics journal stand of the conference platform. And I invite everybody to check the videos out and most importantly, to read, to read the papers because the papers are really, really nice. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce the today's speaker who will give the economic journal invited lecture. Matthew Gensko, Landau Professor of Technology and the Economy at Stanford University, has transformed the field of political economy of media, bringing it from more or less fringe of economics to the mainstream. Without any exaggeration, I can say that Matthew Gensko is a co-founder of the field of modern political economics of media. Professor Gensko made key fundamental contributions that substantially advanced our understanding of the role of media in politics. He studied the sources of media biases, how the structure of media markets affected various political outcomes, uh, ranging from political informativeness uh, to civic engagement, voting, polarization, ideology. He also paid a lot of attention to the question of how technological innovations affecting media landscape, for instance, the introduction of TV affect politics. Matthew Gensko also contributed greatly to other fields of economics. And uh, most important, most notably for me, for example, is uh, his work on methods in applied econometrics and applied economics, which had made an important impact on how applied work is done in political economics. Much of his recent work is devoted to understanding how technological revolution that led to the spread of social media affects lives of people. And I'm delighted that today's lecture is about this topic. And now I invite Professor Gensko to deliver his lecture. Great. Well, thank you so much, Katya. Thanks everybody for taking the time to come and listen. Um, and thanks to the Royal Economic Society and the editors of the Economic Journal for inviting me to come give this lecture. It's, it's a real privilege and an honor. Um, I wanna to talk today about some work that I've been doing and others have been doing, uh, trying to unravel the impact of digital media and smartphones on our lives. I'm gonna refer mostly to, to some work of mine, which is joint with a number of co-authors, Hanthal Kat, Luca Braghieri, Sarah Eichmeyer, and Lena Song. 
in a couple of different configurations. When we think about innovations and new technologies that have a big impact on the world, I think a natural metric for us to scale those with is thinking about their impact on welfare as we traditionally define it. And if we look back over the last century or so and think about which innovations have been biggest in that sense, we can make a list. The list would include things like antibiotics, clean water, electricity, internal combustion engines, railroads, automobiles, and so on. And you know, as, as Bob Gordon and others have argued pretty persuasively, I think the late 19th century, early 20th century was a really unprecedented time for the magnitude of those innovations and everything that's been happening more recently kind of pales a little bit in comparison. And, with, and, and these kind of innovations like digital technologies when measured by this metric are arguably uh, small. And there's, there's a case that the pace of innovation has kind of slowed down in recent years. I'm sympathetic actually to that argument. And, and I think it's a really interesting debate. What I wanna think about today is, is a different perspective uh, on which innovations are big, which is to ask not what is their impact on total welfare, but how much do they change the way that we use our time? And I think that's important because technologies that change the way we use time, technologies that we spend a lot of time with have a different kind of impact on our day-to-day -day lived experience. They, they're there and present and, and really change our lives in a profound way in a, in a different sense. Um, and so the list, if you, know, if, you, if you scale things that way, I think the, the list you end up with is somewhat different. Um, I think there's, you know, you think about something like antibiotics and it, it has a tremendous impact on the world, but it's not something that is present in our lives minute to minute, day to day. Um, so if we wanted to make a list of these things, you know, what, what innovations over the last century have really changed the, the way we use our time, the way we experience time, certainly changes in work we do is one big category of that. So mechanization of agriculture, or the shift from agriculture to industry, or the shift of office jobs with the IT revolution, you know, these are big changes. We look aside from work and think about the rest of our time cars and, and in particular the interstate highway system and the rise of living in suburbs and commuting had a big impact. People these days spend close to an hour a day of their lives in their cars. Um, and then we, we have, if you think about what else is big in that sense, the rise of railroad, of, of radio in the early 20th century ended up accounting for something like an hour per day, of people's time, television, was off the charts in that sense. And, and even a few years after it was introduced in the 1950s, people were watching television routinely three to four hours per day. Computers have been, I think, somewhat smaller. And then what, what really stands out and what I really wanna emphasize for this lecture is that smartphones are, are probably the most important innovation in this sense that has happened since television. The average time that we spend with smartphones is now by best estimates, something like three hours per day that we spend with our phones open actually using them. So this is in, by this scale, an unprecedented, at least in, in recent decades, change in our lives and may have a profound effect. I want to think about what those effects are. Um, this is this is one a, a plot from a great paper by Mark Aguiar and Eric Hurst, just to emphasize how big these things are. Um, they did a study of time use from 1965 up to 2003, looking at how all of the technological progress that had happened over that time contributed to increased leisure time, and then breaking down what people did with that leisure time. And the kind of amazing fact for Maggie Aaron Hurst is that more than 100% of the leisure time that uh, people gained in industrial countries over that half century was devoted to watching television. Television time increased by 
more over that period than total leisure time. And that's against a base in 1960, in 1965, people were already watching television for three hours per day. So television was enormous. And I think smartphones are the first thing that's happened since that is on that same scale. And if we could extend this plot out, I think we would see um, these technologies playing a similarly large role. So, so these, these sorts of innovations, time intensive innovations, change our lived experience in ways that are not always well captured by the usual measures. As, as I wanna talk about more, time intensive innovations, things that reshape our days, produce both outsized optimism about the ways that they may benefit the world, but also consistently they produce outsized fears and concerns and worries about the way that they may be harming the world. They're complicated to analyze and think about because again, in ways that, that I wanna talk about more, they have both large scope for internalities in the sense of, of behavioral aspects that may mean people are not optimizing their own use of those technologies very well. And they also have a great scope for externalities where the way an individual chooses to use those technologies can spill over and impact the broader society. And finally, they're hard to scale and measure. Typical productivity statistics did not do a good job of capturing either the benefits or the costs of these kinds of technologies. A lot of the, a lot of the use of them, for example, is free on the margin. Prices are often zero. That means that the, the traditional way we measure things doesn't do very well. And all of those internalities and externalities are hard to measure as well. Um, and so the, the impact of these kinds of technologies is difficult to measure. The focus for today is the idea that just recently, a, a byproduct in a sense of the same technologies is we're getting at least a bit better at the measurement. And so I wanna to focus today on uh, what I would think of as, as the beginning of a wave of new research, which combining the, the kind of measurement that we can do now with phones in everybody's pockets, with field experiment methodologies to get at causal effects, is giving us new traction on understanding the impact of social media and smartphones. I'm gonna to focus today um, on some work that we've been doing, which I think is you know just one piece of this, it's not gonna answer all of the questions we wanna answer, but it's, it's gonna take hopefully some initial steps in that direction. But although I'm not gonna spend a lot of time summarizing other work, I wanna emphasize this is just one part of a broader stream of research and I hope uh, a growing body of research going forward. So for today, I wanna talk um, first, just a little bit about the historical context of this question and a little bit more about those uh, hopes and fears that these kinds of technologies engender. Then I'm gonna spend most of the time talking about two experiments. One that was randomizing people into quitting Facebook for a period of time to try to measure better the impact of Facebook time on people's lives. And then a second more recent experiment that is trying to measure the behavioral aspects of smartphone use um, and test this idea of digital addiction. Okay. So as I said, there's a lot of other work. I'm just putting up a sampling of it here to just to flag that there are many other people doing important innovative work uh, in this space, both thinking about impact on uh, well-being, the behavioral aspects of smartphones, as well as the political side and, and externalities associated with them as well. Um, let me flag, by the way, I invite everybody to ask questions in the Q&A. Um, I, I think what we're going to try to do is leave 10 minutes or so, 15 minutes or so at the end to have some discussion, but um, we may also, if, if there are questions that uh, be good to talk about as we go along. We're welcome also to submit them now and Katya can interrupt me if, if we wanna talk um, as we go along. Okay, 
So number one, uh, historical context, thinking about these technologies in, in the broader suite before we zoom in on smartphones. Um, I think, you know, this, this idea of, of the hopes and the fears is well captured by Douglas Adams in what is a pretty famous quote um, where he says, anything that is in the world when you're born is normal and ordinary. Anything that's invented between when you're 15 and 35 is new and exciting and revolutionary and you can probably get a career in it. Anything invented after you're 35 is against the natural order of things and something we should probably be very worried about. Um, and that, that you know, applies to lots of things, but it applies especially to these kinds of technologies, um, media and information technologies that eat up a lot of time. There's a, a quote from a uh, dialogue in Phaedrus um, by Plato, where Socrates is quoting a myth from Egypt. I think it may actually be a, a myth that he, that. Plato made up. I don't know that we know that this actually is a, a real Egyptian myth, but where they're debating the terrible impact that uh, writing may have on the world. Think of that as an early proto media innovation. Um, so Themis is uh, an Egyptian pharaoh. Theuth is a god who, among other things, invented writing as the god of writing. And Themis is Faith has just said, what a great thing writing is going to be for the world. And Thamus says, well, actually, this writing discovery is going to be terrible. It's going to create forgetfulness in learners' souls because they don't use their memories anymore. They don't have to remember things. You give them not truth, but only the semblance of truth. They will be hearers of many things, and they will have learned nothing. They will be tiresome company. They'll forget how to interact with each other, and so on. So that sounds a little bit familiar. Radio was accompanied by all kinds of concerns and worries about the way that uh, people shifting their time from face-to-face -face interactions, other things that they were doing, to spending lots and lots of time sitting in front of these boxes uh, producing audio content. This is one quote where concerns about children, the popularity of radio among children has increased rapidly. This new invader of the privacy of the home has brought many a disturbing influence in its wake. Parents are bewildered by a host of new problems and find themselves helpless. They cannot lock out this intruder because it has gained an invincible hold of their children. And then there's television, which as we said, was at least until just recently by far the most dramatic change in the way people used their leisure time that had ever happened, I think it's fair to say. And as we all know, there was a tremendous amount of both optimism early on, but also concerns over time about the effects that television might have. And these effects, I wanna go through, think about this because there's a real echo forward to what we're worried about with this current generation of technology. So if we focus on television, think about what is it that people were worried about, about the way technology, this particular technology, changed people's lives. You could single out a few key concerns. Um, so first was an idea that people watching television are doing something passive. They're not actively doing anything. They're not actively interacting with anybody. They're just mindlessly sitting in front of the TV and that it therefore has a kind of addictive quality like somebody zoned out on drugs. Um, there's a book called The Plug-In Drug which was uh, highlighting a lot of concerns about television. In that book, um, there's a quote, like the sorcerer of old, the television set casts its magic spell, freezing speech and action, turning the living into silent statues. So we have that concern. Second related concern that was really prominent in the discussions of television was this is something which is a solitary activity. People are doing it by themselves or even if they're with other people, they're not really interacting with those people. The primary danger of the television screen lies not so much in the behavior it produces, 
as in the behavior it prevents, the talks, the games, the family festivities and arguments through which much of a child's learning takes place. Turning on the television set can turn off the process that transforms children into people. And here we're talking about children, but you know, this concern was much broader that watching television is crowding out social interactions and interactions among people. Third concern that was expressed, which is quite different, is television is not only a kind of drug that people plug in and space out alone watching, but it's also an incredibly important source of information. It's a place that, that people learn about the world and because it's a place that people learn about the world, which has great power and influence, there are concerns about the ways that it's going to be used by people with influence, by people with power to persuade and mislead audiences. Um, and so a lot of that concern is in the political domain, but it goes beyond the political domain. There were all kinds of worries about mind control, manipulation, propaganda, um, and also relatedly all of the bias uh, and, and political slant that would be uh, part of television content as well. And so here, you know, to emphasize really the, the, the heart of the argument was there's a small number of corporations, small number of powerful actors that control this technology and are going to use it to control all of us. Okay. So that's what everybody was worried about in the television era. And I think, um, we have a lot of speculation. We have a little bit of evidence that we could go back and talk about, about how much these different concerns really were true for TV. But what I wanna to turn to now and for the rest is, well, what, what about smartphones? And uh, to what extent do those same concerns apply? And can we do a better job now than we could with television in really measuring them? And here's, here's an idea I wanna throw out that, that I think is interesting. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, those concerns that we just talked about, addiction, mindless consumption, crowding out real quality social interactions, persuasion, and misleading content, that all sounds very familiar in the current debate about smartphones and digital media. But at the same time, it, you know, put yourselves in the shoes of somebody in 1975 who is worried about television. And imagine I came and told you, well, what do you think if in the future, television is displaced by a new technology? And that new technology is gonna be one where actually people are not just passively sitting there and, and absorbing content. The kids are gonna be making videos and editing them and uploading them to YouTube and people are going to be chatting and producing audio chats and video chats and communicating. Um, it's not passive, it's active. I told you a big part of the central technologies that people are gonna use are gonna be fundamentally about social connections and social interactions. It's gonna be something called social media. And so instead of television where you're just absorbing stuff, the whole thing is gonna to be to a large extent about making friends, connecting with them, keeping in touch with them, sharing content with them and so forth. And instead of the whole thing being directly, the content you see being directly produced and controlled by a few big corporations, it's going to be this crazy democratic experiment where anybody who wants to can upload and broadcast what they see and what they think to huge numbers of people. I think plausibly, that would have sounded pretty good if you were sitting there in 1975. Um, and I think if we look at things that way, we might expect actually this technology we could, could be very, very different than what television was. There's, I think, I think a, a common comfortable place for academics is to always be arguing that whatever looks new to the world actually isn't that new. It's not that really all of this we've seen before and there's a lot of truth in that. And I think there's actually, at the end of the day, I think I'm gonna be on the side of there's a lot of truth of that 
for these technologies too. But I want to emphasize, you know, it's not so obvious. And I think this is one where the case that it could also be very different is pretty strong. Okay. So let's turn now and talk about some evidence, which as I said, is just a first cut at trying to get a little handle on to what extent are these concerns really borne out um, in what we see. So I'm gonna talk about two papers. The first one um, is with Hunt Alcott, Luca Braguieri and Sarah Eichmeier on this experiment we did involving Facebook. And then I'll talk about the digital addiction paper next. So now down into the details. So this was an experiment that we did in 2018. The sample was about 3000 US Facebook users who were recruited on Facebook using Facebook ads. And the basic structure of the experiment was they were randomized into treatment and control group where the treatment group was paid to deactivate their Facebook account for four weeks. Um, and I won't, I won't talk about all the details, but um, imagine that we can monitor that and confirm that they actually do that. Um, and compliance, in fact, with the experiment is gonna turn out to be pretty good. And then we're gonna try to measure a number of different outcomes that relate to all these different issues and concerns we've talked about. First of all, circling back to just welfare as we would traditionally define it and thinking about how much consumer surplus does Facebook create. We can use incentivized mechanisms to determine people's willingness to accept, i.e. what is the price that they would put on four weeks of Facebook time. And that's gonna give us a traditional revealed preference type measure of the consumer surplus that this technology is creating. So you can think about that kind of stacking up on the original scale of you know, how does it compare to antibiotics and so forth. We're gonna be able to measure at least roughly substitution to other time uses. So the average person in this experiment prior to the experiment is using Facebook for about an hour a day. And so we can see if we take that hour away, what are people substituting to? And in particular to what we were just talking about to what extent is it in fact crowding out face-to-face -face interaction as opposed to just crowding out um, you know, time that people would spend, spend alone watching TV or, or doing other things by themselves. You can measure happiness and subjective well-being and get a sense of what is the impact that this has on people's well-being measured in a different way from traditional revealed preference. And then you have some measures that relate more to this persuasion, misinformation set of concerns, looking at how being off of Facebook rather than on it impacts people's knowledge of the news and the extent to which they're politically polarized. So this experiment took place in 2018. We recruited people in late September. They took a midline survey in early October, which is where they were randomized into these two groups. And so the period of deactivation for the treatment group was from October 11th to November 8th. And November 8th was the basically the midterm election in the US. So we timed this to coincide with the four weeks in the run up to the election, basically, because that'll give us more power on these political kind of outcomes. And then there's a, a month later post end line survey that gives us some long run outcomes. We also did some text message surveys throughout the deactivation period for these things like subjective well-being, in addition to asking people at the end retrospectively, hey, how happy were you over the last four weeks? We can send text messages that ask people, how happy do you feel right now? And questions like that. People were recruited on Facebook, as I said, these were the ads. The ads were designed to be kind of generic. Um, we didn't recruit people by saying, do you think Facebook is destroying your life? If so, come sign up for our experiment. We wanted to keep it as neutral as we could. You had to be a US resident, 18 and older. Um, and importantly, there end up being kind of two cutoffs for the treatment here. On one side, you, we only included people who say that they use Facebook at least 15 minutes per day on the view that it's not a great use of our resources to measure the impact of Facebook on people who don't use Facebook. And there's also a cutoff on the other side, which was in the end, we were only able to pay people if their incentivized price for four weeks of Facebook is $100 or less, basically. So that's about half of the people in the study, as I'll show you, 
So you want to think of all the treatment effects I'm going to show you here are local to this sort of not the lightest Facebook users, but also not the ones who value it the very most. We'd love to study the people who, who, who value it at $1,000 per month, but we don't have enough money. So everything here is local to that kind of the big thick middle basically of Facebook users. Deactivation is easy on Facebook. You can deactivate your account and then come back and turn it back on. So this wasn't like people destroy all of their friend connections and their photos and they have to rebuild everything from scratch. They can deactivate for the, cor for the course of the study and then come back and have their Facebook accounts basically the way they were. And it's easy for us to monitor because when accounts are deactivated, um, it's possible to, to measure that directly online. Uh-oh. I'd like you to meet my dog, Ollie. Uh, somebody just like knocked at the front door. So he's gonna bark a little bit for a minute. Um, okay. Thanks to super hard work from a bunch of people, we had very little attrition in this study. So this shows that of the relevant people who were randomized, 99, 98% of them completed the study. Attrition was balanced across treatment and control. Um, and the final row shows that compliance was about 90% 90, 90 in the sense that the treatment group had their accounts deactivated for about 90% of the time. And the control group, of course, didn't. So let's talk about a uh, set of outcomes here. So first, thinking about the broad welfare impact as we usually measure it, what is the consumer surplus that Facebook is creating for the world by a traditional measure? So this is the distribution of willingness to accept for four weeks of Facebook time from this BDM mechanism that we used, which makes these valuations incentive compatible. There's a long tail of people who list very high numbers. I think you have to, I wouldn't take too seriously the people who say a thousand or 2000. I think somebody said a million, um, but you know, the thick of the distribution is, is between zero and $200 or so. The median valuation in the sample is about $100. A lot of people say things like 50, 75. So, you know, you could put big confidence intervals around this, but very broadly order of magnitude. If we think of the valuations here as on average, something like this measure would be $180 per month. You could divide that by two and say $90 per month. One way or the other, it's producing a lot of consumer surplus. And so you would conclude that Facebook um, produces total consumer surplus of about $30 billion per month. Maybe it's 20, maybe it's 40. Um, it's a lot of money. Another question we can ask is, did this experience of being off Facebook for a month change those valuations? That might tell you something about to the extent people are overvaluing Facebook. Um, if you think that time off might correct that. And indeed, we find that the valuations are reduced by about 15% in the treatment group, but not anywhere close to reduced to zero, or, or you know, that's a fairly modest reduction in valuation. So maybe this $30 billion a month overstates things, but you know, I think 10, $20 billion a month, at least by revealed preference, is in the right ballpark. And Yes. There is a clarifying question about the setup of this experiment. So sure. uh, the question is whether you paid money for control and treatment group, and if not, whether actually paying people money for stopping using Facebook would confine, confound the treatment effect. Yeah, that's a great question. So both treatment and control users were paid for participation in the experiment. The treatment users were paid more for um, deactivating. And so you could imagine there is some impact here on some of these outcomes associated with the fact that you're getting that little bit of extra money. Now that said, remember number one, we are eliciting people's valuations and the we're given the distribution of valuations, the net surplus that people are getting, I, how much are we paying them above where they would be indifferent is $20, $30, $40, fairly small. 
And I think if we scale what we know from other evidence about what would be the impact of paying somebody an extra $20 or $40 on things like their long run life satisfaction and happiness, we expect that to be pretty small. So it's a great question and it's not there. You could imagine there is some effect there, but we expect based on a variety of evidence that effect to be fairly small. Okay, great question, thank you. Um, okay, so just a flag there are, as I said, you know, lots of work is being done in this vein. So this is one place where there are a number of other studies that have similar methodologies um, using incentivized, you know, price list mechanisms, BDM mechanisms of various kinds. And the, I would say the order of magnitude, the results are all kind of in similar range for Facebook. Okay. So next we can look at impacts on self-reported happiness. And so you might think, okay, well, if, if this is something that people value so highly, it creates so much consumer surplus, surely uh, it's also making them happier. The flip side of that would be a huge number of people arguing these days that actually these technologies, social media, smartphones more broadly are making people less happy. And so for example, there's a lot of correlational evidence looking at young people uh, suggesting that, that uh, social media use may be associated with increased depression, anxiety, other kinds of mental health issues. And so broadly making people less happy. So what do we learn about that? Well, I think it turns out that based on these results, we do see evidence that Facebook time is making people less happy. This is a plot of treatment effects from the study. And just to kind of walk you through the structure of the plot, the, the things shown in rows are different outcomes. At the bottom is an index, which combines all of these outcomes. And the x-axis is scaled in units of standard deviations of the outcomes. And so if you just look at the index at the bottom, these results suggest that the treatment being off of Facebook increased people's subjective well-being, self-reported happiness by about a tenth of a standard deviation. Um, and then the individual components, our approach in measuring this was just to pull everything that had been a prominent measure in the previous literature looking at subjective well-being. So we have standard measures of happiness, life satisfaction, loneliness, depression, anxiety. Those were flipping the scale here. So positive numbers are good for everything. So that means uh, these estimates suggest less depression, less anxiety, insignificant, but um, less loneliness, boredom. And then the bottom ones are as measured on this uh, text message survey scale. Okay. So if you're off of Facebook, you're happier. That means the effect of being on Facebook is to be less happy. How big are these effects? I think um, you might describe them as moderate. Uh, you can compare them to experiments measuring the impact of things like putting people in therapy for a month. And these effects are something like 25, 40% as large as what you get for that. It's about a third as large as uh, the correlation with college education. Now, of course, it's important to remember both the RCT effects of therapy and the correlation with college education have been viewed as pretty small. So this is in that sense, maybe also pretty small. Um, another comparison point would be, what would you get if you just did what a lot of the prior literature has done and looked at the correlation in our data between how much you use Facebook and your self-reported happiness. And you see correlationally just in the cross section that people who use Facebook more are less happy. Comparing the treatment effect to that correlational estimate, the treatment effect about, is about a third as large. So if you were somebody who was believing your prior was shaped by the correlations that have been reported in a lot of other papers, this would be a downward revision of how much Facebook impacts happiness. Okay, so that's, you know, speaking to this passive mindless activity that is making people depressed and less happy. Remember a second concern that was at the top of the list for television and remains at the top of the list 
here is how is this impacting social interactions and the time that people spend with others is, is the time online crowding out meaningful social interactions. Um, you can get at that a little bit here. This isn't, I would say, a strength of, of this study, but the, the little bit that we can get at it um, is to, uh, to look at how it's changing people's time use. So this is just a picture to emphasize the, you know, there, there are hypotheses on both sides here. So it, it's hard to remember, but not that many years ago, the main thing that we were talking about with Facebook was how it was going to connect people all over the world and increase social connectedness and social interactions. Obviously, a lot of what we've been talking about lately is how it's going to lead people to spend a bunch of time alone and decrease those social interactions. So as I was saying, what we can do is just look at how people's time changes when they're off of Facebook for an hour. And to what extent do we see taking them off of Facebook, they're just gonna to substitute to other digital activities, other social media, they're just gonna watch videos, they're just gonna play video games, or are they actually gonna substitute at all to spending more time with other people? And I think, you know, here it's, it's a kind of mixed picture. So the striking thing from this experiment is when you, when you take people off of Facebook, both other social media time and online time doing anything other than social media, both of those things go down, not up. So it's like Facebook here is a complement, not a substitute for other digital activities. One way to think about that is just if, if you're not taking your phone out of the pocket of your pocket all the time, um, you're less likely to then flip over to your email or flip over to Twitter or flip over to other things. What goes up is pretty much everything else. Things like watching television alone and doing other activities alone, but also there is a small but significant increase in spending time with friends and family. So in that sense, confirm that there is some crowd out here at least of social time. And if you break that down, um, you know, we asked a bunch of different specific activities. And if you compare things in the treatment and control group, the things that the treatment group that's off of Facebook is doing more of, yeah, it's all noisy, take it with a grain of salt, but going out to dinner, getting together with friends, spending time with parents, um, and so on. So I think this is a place where we need a lot more evidence. What we don't have a way to capture here is, you know, to what extent are the online interactions that people have high quality and, and, you know, in some sense, good substitutes for offline interactions, or are they very diminished relative to what people experience in, in real face-to-face? -face? All we can say from this experiment is the, the former is definitely crowding out the latter, at least to some degree. Okay. And then um, on the information and externalities side of this, um, thinking about persuasion, thinking about misinformation, we're able to do basically two things. Um, and so these speak to a whole set of concerns that have been raised about the impact of Facebook and other social media on democracy, on the extent to which people have good or bad information, accurate or inaccurate beliefs. We're gonna be able to do two things here. One is look at impacts on information. How much do people know? And the other is to look at impacts on political polarization. To what extent are people uh, kind of upset with each other and upset with the other side? And so these are the results on knowledge. If you just look at the index at the bottom, the, the striking result is uh, being off of Facebook substantially reduces people's knowledge of factual information in the news. Um, they spend less time they say that they spend less time following news, they're less engaged with politics. And when we give them quizzes that sort of test items that were in the news over the relevant period, they are less likely to get those answers correct. Um, so on this index, it's about two tenths of a standard deviation reduction in news knowledge. Um, we also ask them questions about their belief in prominent misinformation that was circulated on Facebook during this period. Um, and so we don't see any sense in which they're more likely to believe those false stories um, 
the people are more likely to believe those false stories when they're on Facebook than when they're off Facebook. That's noisy. I would not take that as like the world's best estimate of the impact of misinformation, but for what it's worth, we don't see this uh, news knowledge effect offset by um, people on Facebook believing more misinformation. These are the results on polarization. We try to measure polarization in a bunch of different ways that have been used in the literature, including affective polarization, how people feel about each other, issue polarization, how divided are they in their beliefs on specific issues. And there we see a significant reduction in polarization when people are off of Facebook, about um, 15 hundredths of a standard deviation. Uh, so it's sort of a nuanced picture. You know, what is, what is social media doing to people's beliefs? It is doing something good actually, which is informing people. And I think that the reality is we tend to imagine maybe a lot of these people, if they weren't getting all their information from Facebook, they would be reading the New York Times or watching the BBC or doing some other high quality kind of activity. But the reality is, particularly in the US, I think the real substitute for a lot of people is if they aren't getting information from Facebook, they're not getting any information at all. So that's good. The flip side is it also has the impact of, of increasing polarization and making people more upset at each other. So it's a tricky trade-off. Would we rather have a democracy where people don't know what's going on and they're also not mad at each other? Or would we rather have them more informed, but also potentially more polarized? Okay. So I'll come back and, and, and talk at the end about how all these pieces of evidence kind of pull together um, to pull together the threads. But let me talk now uh, for a few minutes about this second experiment. This is, oh gosh. The, the, so first of all, this is the wrong subtitle. This has not been published in the AER nor accepted in the AR, though if any AER editors are listening and would like to accept it, please feel free. Um, and it's with Hunt Alcott and Lena Song as the co-authors. Okay, so here we wanna kind of zoom in, I think motivated by that first study where you have this pattern of something that people seem to value tremendously, but also seems to make them less happy, at least on the margin. We wanna zero in on that issue and the idea, which has been mentioned in tons of books and all over the place, that a specific thing that may be going on is that there are behavioral biases that lead people to overconsume these technologies. And that maybe what's going on is there's a lot of value and in inframarginal minutes that people spend but the marginal minutes uh, go beyond what is really good for them due to something like addiction, just as the marginal drink that an alcoholic has or the marginal cigarette that somebody smokes or um, go beyond what is really good for their own welfare. So this idea has been widely discussed. There's been a lot of assertions that there are addictive characteristics to phones and social media. We wanna try to dig in and test that. To do that, we're gonna do another experiment. This one involving about 2000 participants. In this case, we're gonna focus on people who use Android. And the reason for that is that experiment is gonna be built around a custom app that we created um, that allows us to both measure what people are doing on their phones and give people the ability to control set limits on their own usage. So 2000 Android users, here, we're gonna have two main treatments. One is a little bit in the spirit of the Facebook deactivation thing. Here, we're not gonna ask people to deactivate anything, but we're gonna have a bonus payment for reductions in the overall use of key apps on their phones. So we're basically pay people to reduce their usage. And at the end of the day, that's gonna have a similar effect in the sense that people cut back usage by about an hour per day as a result of that bonus. The second treatment is offering people commitment devices. And here we're not paying them to use them. We're just giving people the option to use a commitment device that lets them limit their own use in the future. Um, and then the paper is going to have a model, which I won't talk about at all here, but which is, is a, a model of consumption of an addictive good, which is subject both to habit formation, i.e. addiction in the Beccarian sense, and also potentially temptation a la beta delta preferences or hyperbolic discounting. Um, and so these two treatments 
the screen time bonus and the limits are going to feed directly into identifying the parameters of that model and thinking about how big is habit formation. You can think about that because if I reduce your usage temporarily through a bonus, I can then look at how your usage changes once that bonus is gone. And temptation, because somebody who doesn't have any temptation or time inconsistency or self-control problems should have no use for commitment devices The take up an impact of those commitment devices will tell us something about temptation. Um, and so the outcomes here will be mainly looking at how these things impact people's time on their phones, but we also have a whole host of survey related measures to see, do these interventions increase subjective well-being? Do they decrease uh, psychometric style measures of addiction um, and so on. Okay, so here's this timeline. We did this in 2020, recruited people in March. The midline where people were randomized was May 3rd. That's where the treatment interventions begin. There are two endline surveys at three and six weeks later. And then in this case, because we have this app on people's phone, we can keep following and measuring their usage for some time after the final survey. Um, and so we required everybody to stay in the study until July 26th, which is another six weeks later. That's when we stopped measuring. We're again recruiting people on Facebook with, with ads. Again, the ads are kind of generic. Here, you have to be a US resident, 18 or older, say that you have one phone that you use primarily, and that phone has to be Android. I mentioned we're gonna kind of focus on key apps here. What I mean by that is we define a set of six apps Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, browsers, and YouTube, um, Chrome, or other browsers here. We just put the Chrome icon. Um, and so these are chosen because they're for the combination of them being things that people spend a lot of time on and also say that they uh, feel like they overconsume. And so all of the incentives, the bonuses, the limits, everything's going to apply to this set of six apps. So you can think of it as social media plus you know, YouTube, which arguably is not social media. This is what phone dashboard looks like, this app that we built for the experiment. It's a little bit like screen time on your iPhone. If you have an iPhone, it, it records how much you use each app and you can track that, look at that. The key difference with something like screen time is phone dashboard lets us set actually hard limits where if people want to, and they're in this limit treatment, they can limit their usage in the subsequent day and have those limits be, be hard, not something that you can just override the way you can with screen time. Here's attrition for this experiment. Again, thanks to very hard work from everybody on the team of the sample that was randomized, we managed to keep more than 95% of them um, in the study all the way through. And so there's no imbalance in attrition between treatment and control. This is at baseline what people say about their own perception of their phone use. Um, so we asked people looking back over the past three weeks, how much, and we show people based on the phone dashboard app, this is at the midline survey, we show people, here's how many minutes per day you actually used your phone on average. We asked them, how much would you ideally have increased or reduced your usage? Um, and you can see that a majority of people would like to reduce their usage and quite a number of them pretty substantially. Numbers like, I'd like to reduce it by 20%, 30%, 50%. But also importantly, there's heterogeneity in that. And there's a good you know, 40% of people or so who say, no, nah, no, nah, actually I'm, I'm fine, thanks. My usage was just what I'd like it to be. Um, so I think that heterogeneity is really important and is a theme it, it runs through both of these studies. Remember the heterogeneity and those willingness to accept numbers in the first study. Um, one thing that's really important that comes out of both of these experiments is there's just a ton of heterogeneity. We don't really wanna think about the impact of smartphones as one thing. It really differs across different people. Here's how that, that gap between actual usage and ideal usage varies across different apps on the phone. And this relates to why we chose those Fitzby apps. Facebook has, is, stands out as being the thing people want to reduce the most. Games, Instagram, browsers, YouTube, Twitter, Snapchat, and so on. Um, okay, so the bonus treatment, we're going to offer to pay people $50 for every hour they reduce their average daily usage over a three-week period. And a key thing here is the way the timing works. We tell that to people on the midline survey, 
it then doesn't go into effect for three weeks. So they have a three week period where they know it's coming, but it hasn't started. It's then in effect for three weeks and then it's over, but we get to keep monitoring people's usage after it's over. And here's the impact of that on usage. So um, period three is where the bonus is actually in effect. That's where um, we're actually paying people. And you see that in the bonus period, people reduce their usage by about 60 minutes per day. Habit formation is gonna be identified by once that's over, do those same people continue using less? And the answer is they do by about, so here we're not paying you anything to reduce your usage, but you continue to use about 20 minutes less per day. And another three weeks later, what we call period five, so that's now you know, six weeks after the bonus ended, um, people are still reducing their usage by maybe 15 minutes per day. And we also see interestingly, a little bit of an anticipatory effect. This is something that rational addiction models, the kind of classic test of rational addiction models that you might see this uh, anticipatory reduction in usage. So that's the bonus treatment. The limit treatment is gonna offer subjects access to the limit functions in phone dashboard. Those let them set limits on their future behavior. There are no incentives to do so. It's free to use or not, free disposal. So this is something that for a rational time consistent agent should have no impact. They should have no reason to want to use such limits, but somebody who's subject to temptation should and would. Um, and we see there, there's actually very high take up of using those limits. The limits that people set are binding. They set limits which really do constrain their behavior. And this plot shows the total impact of those on their usage. Just having access to those limits reduces people's usage of these Fitzby apps by about 20 minutes per day, um, consistently over all the periods where that's available. Okay, so those are, and this we think of as, as identifying temptation basically. So we have a key result on habit formation, a key result on temptation. These are the survey outcomes I mentioned. So positive numbers here mean you are happier and or you look less addicted by various measures. This addiction scale is, a, is an adapted psychometric scale. That's how when psychologists and doctors, medical people think about addiction, it's often defined on the basis of these scales where we ask you 20 questions. And if you say yes to 10 or more of them, we say you're addicted, that kind of thing. So to connect to that literature, we have those scales here. We have one we did by text messages. Um, and on all of these, you see clear, substantial, significant effects. So having access to either the bonus or the limit treatment makes people less addicted by those measures, look less addicted. There's less gap between their ideal usage and their actual usage. They're more likely to say their phone makes their life better, particularly for the limit treatment. And there's marginally significant improvements in people's subjective well-being. Okay. And then the final part of that paper is some uh, structural analysis where we use those treatment effects to identify key parameters of the model. Um, and then once we've estimated the model, we can ask, the nice thing about the, the model then is we can ask, okay, all in, how big an impact does the non-rational addictive component of these goods, how big is that effect? Um, and we can do that by simulating a counterfactual where the non-rational temptation component of addiction is turned off. And I don't have time to go through any details of that, but the main results are if we turn off non-rational addiction, people would be using their phones by about 25% less. That's about 40 minutes less on a baseline of 160, 150 minutes. Um, and you know, the kind of rough back of the envelope calculation here would imply that doing that would increase the consumer surplus of each person by about $125 per year, um, which is, you know, that's smaller than the estimate from before of what the total surplus from Facebook is. That seems to make sense given that these are marginal minutes um, that we're reducing. Okay. So let me wrap up and say a few last things and then hopefully have a little more time for Q and A. So the first thing I wanna say in conclusion is just to flag, you know, if this was an actual seminar, you would have already hopefully been all berating me with uh, concerns and critiques of these experiments. There are lots of limitations and weaknesses of them that are important to keep in mind. A few of those are 
One, we are studying a selected sample of people who chose to participate in this experiment and the impacts on that group may be quite different than uh, on the full population. It's very much an individual level, quote unquote, partial equilibrium treatment where we're, we are changing your usage of Facebook, holding constant everyone else in the world using Facebook. And that can be very different from what would happen if everyone stopped using Facebook uh, or if all of your friends stopped using Facebook. There's scope for experiment or demand effects here, or, or maybe I think actually more importantly, just awareness of being part of an experiment could change your behavior, kind of Hawthorne effects. Um, and the monitoring technology we have is imperfect. So there's, there can be scope for, for measurement there, there. Okay, so those are caveats. Just turning to the conclusions, remember the, these kind of three main concerns that people expressed in the TV era and have again been expressing is smartphone use and social media passive, mindless and addictive? Well, I think passive and mindless, uh, not from the evidence, but just from first principles, I think is quite different here. Some of it is passive, but a lot of it isn't. We actually tested in the Facebook experiment whether effects are any different for people who say their usage is mostly doing active things versus passive things, and we don't see any difference. But particularly with the second experiment, we see the addictive properties are very real. These things are tempting habit forming, and there's substantial overconsumption. That's heterogeneous, it varies a lot across users. I think an important you know, kind of high level point for an economist here is it's maybe not surprising to see that these technologies end up being designed to lead people to overconsume, given that monetizing attention is the way um, you make money in this business. And that is not new. There's a lot of talk about that somehow new being some new thing that social media companies are doing. But of course, that was true for television companies as well, and radio broadcasters as well, and people who make movies and people who make comic books and all kinds of other things. When attention is the currency, I think we may expect to see this kind of pattern. Um, solitary, not social. There's more scope here for social interaction, but it's certainly true that online time does crowd out offline interactions. And I think broadly, these kind of mental health impacts we see are consistent with the view that somehow the online social interactions that are happening are not giving people the same kind of uh, experience and, and psychological benefit that real world interactions do. But that's something I think we need more evidence on. On the persuasion and misleading, as we said, it makes people more informed, but also more polarized. Um, there's a lot of stuff on social media that is not great. You could certainly imagine people using that time to do something better, but I think it's important to remember for many people, the alternative may be no news or information rather than better news. Okay, so let's stop there and hopefully have some time for a few questions. Thank you very much, Matt. So there are several questions indeed, and uh, a bunch of questions uh, have to do with the longer term effects uh, of both of your experiments. Can you focus, oh, can you comment please on first of all, what are the longer term effects on, fact, uh, on happiness from the first experiment? And uh, also given that you had this follow up survey uh, and also as far regarding the second experiment, could you, uh, comment on how long-term are the effects of the habit formation in particular? Great. Um, yeah, that, that's a really important question. And I would answer it first as just, this is another caveat that should be on that list that while we can do a little long-term measurement out to four weeks or six weeks or 12 weeks, you know, fundamentally here, we are only able to look at relatively short run impacts and the really long run impacts over, um, you know, years, decades is not something we can study. So first of all, that is for sure another limitation. In terms of what we can say, so in the first study, we do have this follow-up um, survey about a month after the experiment is done. We do not repeat the happiness measures there. So we unfortunately can't look directly at longer term impacts on happiness. What we do do there is measure people's usage. And so we get something similar to the habit formation kind of estimate from the second paper. Um, and we also measure, remeasure the valuations, as I'd mentioned, and we collect a lot of qualitative information where we did interviews. There's actually a separate paper that was published by some 
other authors who did a qualitative study piggybacking with, you know, in, in collaboration with us as part of this, they were doing interviews of the participants and, um, and wrote that up. So from all of those, what you see is there are people who have had this four weeks off of Facebook as of a month later are clearly continuing to use Facebook less. They value Facebook less and qualitatively they say, I really learned, you know, the, the modal answer is some version of, I learned that I was using this more than was good for me and I'm trying to reduce it. Now there's a lot of heterogeneity in that too. And you also see in this experiment, there's some people whose experience is being off of Facebook was terrible. That's where I connect most with my friends. I missed my kid's birthday and so on. So it's, it's heterogeneous, but on average, I think there was a long-term persistent move toward people using it somewhat less. Um, and you can see that partly too. And another thing we can measure in that study is how long it takes people to reactivate their Facebook accounts. And um, the control group in the experiment, we actually have them deactivate their account at the end for 24 hours, just so everybody's kind of on the same baseline of, okay, now everybody's account is deactivated. And then we can watch how quickly they reactivate. And the, the treatment group takes much, much, much longer to reactivate their accounts. All that said, that those differences are not that big. It's a 15% difference in valuation. And eventually most people in the treatment group do, do reactivate, so small. Um, in the second experiment, the habit formation, um, I showed you those, those you know, habit effects out to three and six weeks and you could see they were kind of decaying. And I think what we see is consistent with what our model of habit formation, which is a standard Becker-Murphy style uh, specification, predicts that as you go out in time away from that treatment, that should decay gradually. And what we see is consistent with that. So the, those habit formation effects get smaller as time goes out, but we can't go you know, beyond uh, six, nine, 12 weeks out in that experiment. Great, so there's also a set of questions about heterogeneity of the effects uh, for both papers. Heterogeneity by all sorts of different dimensions, some of which I think you will be able to answer about, some probably not. There were questions on heterogeneity by countries, cultures, uh, regions, religions, professions, age, and so on and so forth. There is also a bunch of questions about the heterogeneity with respect to which apps are uh, more and less damaging in terms of welfare uh, and uh, you know life satisfaction and also in terms of addiction. And uh, I will let you answer these first now. Yeah, so, so these are, that's another really important set of questions. Um, I mean, you might have wondered why I didn't show you any heterogeneous treatment effects in, in those slides. Um, and the reason is, in, you know, in the pre-registration plans for both of these studies, there is extensive analysis of heterogeneity. And in both cases, up to the precision we have in the studies, the actual results suggest surprisingly little heterogeneity on the dimensions that we can measure. So. As I emphasize, there is heterogeneity in the sense that there is a wide distribution of um, you know, how addicted people say they are, how much they want to reduce, how much they value Facebook. But that variation, and more importantly, the variation in the effects of these treatments, for the most part, are not very correlated with characteristics you think might be important. So they don't differ, the effects don't differ significantly by age don't differ significantly by gender, don't differ significantly by political persuasion point of view in the first study. Um, I think you know the, the clearest heterogeneity is just larger impacts for heavier users, which you would expect. And in the second study, in terms of what we can measure, the clearest heterogeneity is um, in some sense, these self-control interventions are well targeted in that their effects are bigger for the people who report the most symptoms of addiction. So if you take people on the baseline survey who sound like they have addiction issues, those are the same people who have the biggest treatment effects of those, um, of those technologies. Now, in terms of which apps have the biggest impact, you know, this is, this is something we're not great on because both of these experiments are pretty blunt 
the Facebook experiment is just Facebook. And then the digital addiction experiment is just this set of six apps kind of bluntly moving all of them together. We didn't have, it was a choice in terms of power not to try to have separate treatments that you know incentivize changes in Instagram and Snapchat and so on one by one. Um, so we can't really do that. I think you know, one thing that's interesting to think about is the, the well-being happiness impacts we see in the um, second study are quite a bit smaller than those that we see in the first study. Now they're very different studies, they're different samples, many things could account for that. But one way to think about it might be the first study reduced Facebook usage from an hour per day to zero. The second study reduced usage of a whole bunch of different apps by cumulatively about an hour per day. So the same number of total minutes, but reducing Facebook by less and reducing YouTube, other things by more. Um, and so one, if you really squint, you could read into that some evidence that maybe Facebook has a particularly negative impact on happiness. And if you did read things that way, that would be consistent with both a lot of the anecdotal, the sort of self-report interviews, um, and also with what I showed you in terms of Facebook standing out as the app that people perceive the biggest gap between what they're actually doing and what they would like to be doing. Right. So there's another very interesting set of questions about the mechanism for how and why uh, Facebook actually changes your uh, information set and polarization. In particular, people are wondering whether uh, this is because now we uh, do not have skills anymore to find news without, without these uh, media apps. Yeah, I don't think that is the hypothesis that I would jump to. I, I, th I think the really important fact to keep in mind is if you look at media consumption in the US prior to uh, any social media being introduced, so take circa 2000, say, media consumption in the US, the, the overwhelming fact is just how little news anybody consumes. We talk a ton in this country about cable news and Fox News and CNN and all of the political content and, and slant and these outlets. But you know the share of Americans who watch any cable news for more than, I don't remember, you know something like 15 minutes per month is quite small, a minority, maybe 20, 30% of people. So you know, most people don't don't read. If you look at what share of online time is news, um, you know that's a well less than one percent. I think it's a very very small number. Um, and so the you know even in the past, people were not very good in a sense at um, consuming news. Now of course it's true that this these new technologies add a bunch of complexities to that and make it more challenging. It certainly makes understanding the provenance of things more challenging. And there is, I think, this really important move from you're getting information from a small number of sources that you know well and trust to you're getting information from a ton of different sources who, whose provenance is, um, right. is pretty much unknown. So I think, I think that to me, the most basic mechanism is likely to be taking a large set of people who have low political interest, who have low engagement with the news at baseline, they would have had low engagement with the news at baseline, whether we're talking about 2000 or 2015 or 2020, and exposing those people to more um, political information. There is a separate set of things, which is about what happens to the to kind of people in the tails and, and small, you know, these studies are really focused on what is the average effect. And, I, and just to flag, I think the mechanisms are very different if we're thinking about, is there 1% of people or half a percent of people who are really dramatically impacted in their beliefs and their actions? Um, you know, and I, I think a, a, to me, one of the most worrying things about social media is not the average impact, but is those ability to have large impacts on small numbers of people. And so that includes things like, you know, provoking ethnic violence or leading people to come storm the US Capitol, 
you know, there's a lot of, um, a lot of potential for that, even if the average effect is fairly benign. Thanks very much, Matt. So we are technically out of time, but uh, there are uh, many more questions actually out there. And let me uh, summarize the, the topics. So there were a bunch of questions uh, on whether uh, the uh, second experiment uh, timing during the COVID epidemic may have uh, changed the results. So what's the external validity? And uh, there are uh, a bunch of questions about uh, whether uh, there could be a mismatch between sort of the social stigma of uh, uh, the being, being online and social media and your own use of it. So could it be that people want to limit it, not because they are addicted, but because they think that uh, this is just a bad uh, behavior because of the social, social attitude to that? Great. Yeah, those are those are great questions. I'll leave. We do the COVID thing. I mean, I'll refer you to the paper for the the COVID thing is a big issue, and we do a little bit of work to try to get at that. But I think we'll have to leave those as good questions um, that, with more time, we should certainly talk about more. Thank you very much. So I will officially close the session. But before, I would like to ask, uh, on behalf of the admin admin res, to uh, evaluate the session. And you will find some kind of a question somewhere on the right side of the platform for this. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, Matt, for this illuminating uh, uh, lecture. And uh, we look forward to reading uh, more, more of your work. Thank you. Thanks so much, Katya. Thanks, everybody.